Hello, everyone. Welcome to FanFest. Uh, my name is uh, Derek Wise, uh, also known as CCP Yokai. I am the technical director of virtual world operations. It basically means I'm responsible for all of our production systems uh, and the technical decisions that are made there. Uh, my name is Emil Fredriksson, or also, named, uh, also known as CCP Valar. I'm the, uh, the senior, what's your world, database administrator, and I handle the databases that E Online runs on, mostly, mostly the production ones. So, so basically, today we're going to talk about uh, TQ's new toys. Specifically, we're going to focus on the database. Um, I don't know if uh, how many people have been able to see the dev blog that went out yesterday, but we're actually going to give you more here than the dev blog got, so as uh, nitty gritty and as much detail as you want. So before we started the project for the database upgrade, we had a few goals to keep in mind. Uh, we wanted to make sure we kept up with load um, uh, on the system. This has to do with new processes, new tools, uh, not just new game content that was coming out, but also things that we were doing internally to keep the database clean and neat. Took a lot more workload and burden uh, was being put onto the database servers. Uh, we wanted to have redundancy at every level. We'll go into this more in a, an additional slide, but there were definitely some places where we just wanted, we didn't have the redundancy that we needed for uh, EVE Online. And also we wanted to simplify the design of the, of the infrastructure itself. Previously, it was fairly complex. Maintenance was a pain in the butt, and we, had to, we needed a way to fix it. And we also just wanted a bunch more options. Whenever we have a massive failure or catastrophic outage, we wanted options to recover from rather than 31 hours of backups on tape. There's a few terms that we want to make explicit before we started this. Um, this, is, this is CCP starting basically an internal dialogue about the service level agreement, the SLA, that we're going to have on ourselves for performing um, on our infrastructure. This hasn't gone out publicly yet, so it's really the first time we're talking about it. But internally, we're starting to define high availability as in something that happens in less than a couple of minutes. So we need to be able to fill over between clusters in less than two minutes. We need to be, be able to measure that in seconds. Same thing with disaster recovery, where we actually have a catastrophic failure on, a, on one side of the hardware. Um, we need to be able to get back to that in less than two hours. And then business continuity, this one's a little harder to explain. But basically, um, if uh, you know, Titan drops out of orbit and starts shooting at one of our uh, data centers. What do we do from there? So there are plans in place for that as well, as long as it's not a Ragnarok. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. Uh, the additional load we've been having on the database, uh, we, we made the inventory system 64-bit. That, that grew our biggest tables, uh, grew all of our indexes, and, and just... <laughs> We need more performance for that. The API is always being expanded, and, uh, and the API is actually uh, contributes to a lot of load to the database. Uh, EveGate is starting to be used more and more, and, and they're adding features to it, so that also adds load to the database. And we needed to, to take into account that Incarna and Dust will run on the same cl cluster as, as uh, Eve. Incarna is a part of Eve, but so, and, and we're always growing a subscriber base, so we have to keep up with that. And we wanted to have also some extra capacity for like, the unknown future. Yeah, I, I think some of the cool things to point out, um, we, we haven't said it publicly before, I don't think, that Dust514 is planned to run on, the T, on TQ. So at least portions of the oh. game are going to be on TQ. So that's uh, when we start talking about the immersion and the, the universe being one universe, it's really one universe even from a hardware perspective. So it's one of those things we want to make sure we are counting for for future growth. And then API, I, it, we, it takes up about 10% of our database use today. So 10% of the CPU capacity today is what we've seen yeah, up to that on the API. So it's yeah. a pretty significant hit on our database. Yeah, it's a significant hit, and it's also like the biggest queries, biggest result set that's coming, that's coming from the database come from the API because you can get like uh, your wallet transaction load a lot, lot more of it uh, at one time than if you're doing it through the game client, for example. Uh, the next thing we want to talk about is redundancy. Um, we didn't have as many happy faces, so uh, actually I made this graph one night. I was drinking a little and decided the only way to explain it to the executive board was with happy faces and little red circles. Um, so it, this is actually part of the presentation to our executive board. This is Hilmar and uh, everyone sitting in a room and I was like, on the left is what our system looks like today. There's lots of not happy there. Um, we didn't have the redundancy in our ethernet layer that we wanted. 
Uh, we didn't have uh, the redundancy in our storage tier that we wanted. And for anybody that thinks the tapes tiers can actually be redundant, it's kind of silly. We, did, we just didn't even try to make tape redundant. We're actually just trying to get rid of tape as much as possible. Uh, so part of the, what we did on the, uh, the infrastructure was we wanted to make sure that every single tier in the infrastructure was one for one paired with its uh, adjacent unit and there was no oversubscription of the environment at all. Um, so this meant that every single fiber channel cable, um, every single ethernet port was connected to a separate switch, bonded together with another redundant um, uh, port of its own. And um, the same thing on the servers. There was a server to match every server. There was a switch to match every switch. There was an entire storage column, which uh, typically, um, I even in enterprise networks, they'll take a really nice storage column like the Storewise V7000 that we're using. It has uh, redundant controllers in it, it has redundant power supply, so you just put one column in place. We actually made two separate redundant columns just to make sure there wasn't any, um, any room for error there. Uh, in OTQ, we, we, uh, we actually start with that we wanted to simplify our environment. Uh, as, as Derek said, it was quite complicated and uh, had too many layers. We, we, we OTQ had eight devices. Uh, it, it had uh, two servers, two SAN switches, Ramson 500, Ramson 400, Ram, and another Ramson 400 and the DS4800 disk array, which is just completely too much. Uh, we, we could have gone with just buying more Ramsons, buying, buy, buying like two more Ramson 400s or something like that. But instead, we di decided to go with a simple design uh, from IBM, which only has six devices. It's two servers, two SAN switches, and the two storage columns, so the Storewise V7000, which is brand new, we just released it. Yeah, I think, and Helgi's in here, but I, I think we're like the first month of general release for the product, right? Yeah, he's yeah. in, I got a thumbs up. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, w while we, we have the storage uh, set up in, in two separate racks, everything is, is exactly the same on both sides. Uh, we're setting up mirroring between uh, between the two storage columns, and we we just we had the whole unit ready. When when we switched over to new database, we had like a what three hour downtime? Yeah, three hour downtime. But the actual we uh, the time it took just to upgrade to the new database system was seventy some odd minutes, right? Yeah, the rest was just testing to see if everything was working okay. Mainly, just is there anyone from QA in here? It was mainly just QA slowing us down those three hours. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just want to point that out. There's no one yeah. here. Oh, hey, what's up? <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, but yeah, we can maintain all our hardware lives. We can we can fail over to standby units, take the other side down, uh, and we can even fail over the database, uh, the SQL clusters, without losing more than like. Three nodes. We've been messing with the system and, and <laughs> causing the database to crash a few times. Yeah, we're, we're going to stop messing with shit for a while. Uh, also, we wanted options. So uh, one of the things that we found out, uh, Ingvar, our director of IT, is back here as well. One of the things we found out during a massive outage we had when we moved TQ to the new data center uh, was we didn't have options. We, we had a da database failed. Uh, the backup of the database was on a set of drives. Those drives were corrupted. We had to restore the corrupted drives. We then had to go about, had, had to go through nine or ten hours of transaction logs to restore on slower disk because we didn't have the high performance stuff in place that we needed. So there's lots of things that were just kind of bottlenecks for us and uh, it took two or three really big problems to cause a catastrophic outage. So what we wanted was we wanted every option we could find for recovery and resolution quickly. So um, there's a few things here. These are specific terms to some of the IBM devices, but I'll, I'll try and explain them pretty quickly. Uh, there's a metro mirroring option that we have enabled in our system, which allows us to synchronously write to two separate columns of disk storage arrays. Um, there's also a global mirroring option, which is basically a little different. It writes to one side, and when it has time, it synchronizes it to the other side of the storage array. We also have something called flash copy. I think uh, whenever we had one of our outages, someone asked, where, where's your snap volume mirroring? Where's your snap copies? This is that. So um, this is, this is going to give us the ability to recover point in time uh, from a snap, uh, an image of the database. 
rather than restoring a lot of transaction yeah. logs. Restoring the whole database or having to go back and figure out which transaction logs we're going to use, all that stuff kind of goes away. We can, we can just look at snaps here. So it doesn't mean that we, we can't use the, the current full backup and transaction logs. It just means we have another choice in our pocket. Um, more backup stored online. We went from two terabytes of SSDs to two terabytes of SSDs and 14.1 of uh, 15K 36 spindle SAS on one side. So we, we really gave ourselves lots and lots of terabytes to do other things with, and not only for the production side, but for the non-production side of the house, like research statistics, they're getting access to this performance as well. And also, fuck tape. Yeah, but we, 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 still, we still back up to tape, but... Uh, no, fuck tape. <laughs> we do still back up to tape. I'm in charge here, fuck tape. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just wa always want to say that on live TV. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then uh, the next part, this is the really fun thing. If, if, you, if you haven't seen the dev blog that went out, you know, the, the previous stuff we showed you here, the dev blog didn't have. This is a lot what, that came from the dev blog. Um, I've also got all of our data, um, the spreadsheets, and things that we did about our storage configuration. So feel free during the Q&A. We're trying to make the, the initial presentation quick so that you can have as much Q&A as you want, and we're, we're happy to sh uh, you know, lift our skirts, so to speak. <laughs> all right, uh, so um, the step one in, in, the, in the process was making sure we upgraded the storage network. Uh, one of the things we found was four gigabit per second just wasn't enough on the fiber channel connectivity. Uh, it, it sounds like a lot, right? But it's not. And uh, we were hitting that peak during backup and doing our initial startup um, and, and under load. Yeah, uh, just every time we did some online operations like deletes or... And this really hurt us in the things that we could do. This is back to having options. So we couldn't run as many backups as we wanted to. We couldn't do as many things we wanted to because we were choking down the bandwidth. So we were using fewer backups. The backups were taking longer. Every time we ran a backup, it was eating up some of the capacity that was available for uh, players as well. So we went from 8 gigabits per second to 32 gigabits per second or so. So we thought that was a cool upgrade. Uh, and just to, be, uh, just to be fair, that 8 gigabits... Uh, on, the, on the previous system, that was two 4 gig ports. On the new system, that's four 8 gig ports, and two of those 8 gig ports are bonded together in a 16 gigabit per second trunk. So literally, we've tested this system up over 10, 10.5 gigabit per second yeah. throughput. Uh, so we know it works. We can go across the bonded trunks, and it works really well. Uh, step two was to upgrade the RAM. Um, uh, we used to think like 128 gig was pretty awesome. When I first came here, I was like, 128 gig, that's pretty cool, you know? I, yeah, I, I liked yeah, it, yeah. and I was like, we have 111 gigs uh, dedicated to DB cache. I'm like, sweet. <laughs> We're doing 460 now, because we just thought it was a better number. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, when I walked into Hilmar's office, and I was like, hey, I want to put a half a terabyte of RAM into our DB servers. He was like, why? <laughs> I'm like, is this cool? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, <laughs> we move up to this, and what it really did for us, so actually on the techno mumbo jumbo side, what it really did make significant difference for us. We took our page life expectancy, the amount of time that we're able to take an item and leave it in the, in the RAM from, what was it, uh, 7.9 minutes to 2.8 hours. So literally the data that you're reading from, at least most of the data that you're reading while you're working, is coming directly from RAM. There's no RAM SAN 500, there's no fiber channel connectivity, there's no SAN, there's no switching. It's coming from the RAM in the DB server. This is a huge increase. And this was our way to make sure we got the enterprise level service we wanted out of having redundant storage arrays. And those of you that understand fiber channel and how this works, when you start doing this redundancy, you do slow down performance. And this is our way to augment that by sticking about four times the RAM in it. Yeah, and, and we looked at the statistics of, of the weights in the database after we put this in place. And it's normal to have some IO weights and stuff. But the only synchronous writes a database server does is to write to the transaction log because that ensures the consistency of the database. And over 60% of the weights in the database are just writing to the transaction log because we get almost everything from RAM. We rarely have to read anything from disk. Yeah, and I guess that's where this number comes from because I think it's actually 100%. This is wrong. 97% uh, <laughs> of, um, of our transactions go to buffer cache, go into that RAM. We're in, and that was on our previous system. On the new system, we're at 99.7. It doesn't sound like a big change, but if you think about it, it's exponential in the impact to the game. And uh, that 0.3 that's left over, I'm positive that's just the transaction logs in the way. Everything no, else no, is no. in RAM. It, it has to, because the database is 1.7 terabytes, it, has to, it can't all fit in RAM. Why, why do you got to always argue with me? <laughs> <laughs> it was cooler to say, yeah, we don't uh, use disk. 100%. We don't need no stink stinking disk, man. Um, needs more RAM. Needs more RAM. Yeah, yeah. Let's go to two terabytes of RAM. Uh, Jeff, one of our DBAs back there. 
Uh, <laughs> denormalize, sorry, denormalize. We don't use real names here. Hmm. Well, you know what? I tried to do that, but Hilmar wouldn't give me the extra cash. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, actually, and, and I had a couple of people ask me these questions. Why didn't we go to four, core, uh, four CPUs? Why didn't we go to one terabyte of RAM? Really good question. Uh, Microsoft in the house? Any, anyone from Microsoft here? The licensing model for, for, for SQL sucks. <laughs> what it costs me to put two more um, sockets into a server is retarded. Uh, Oh, is that on trust? Is that back in like Windows NT 4.0 when you put in 419.11111? Remember doing that? Like nobody needs a key anymore? Okay, they've gone back to Microsoft. Now trust you. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so uh, that, that's part of it. And then uh, on the, uh, the CPU upgrade, th this was, this was kind of critical for us. Um, when I was talking to Helgi at IBM, uh, we were going from 2.66 to 2.26. And I was like, dude. If it's not four gig, it don't count, that kind of stuff. It's like, I don't understand why we couldn't get a higher performance processor. But when we started looking at the benchmarks and what it could actually do, they assured me that going from 12 cores that weren't hyper-thread capable to 16 cores that were made a huge difference. And man, it's like massive what we can do with the system now. Um, and uh, I know there's some AMD fans out there. I'm an AMD fan too. But for a database, for our specific type of database, um, we saw performance gains over what we could do on other processors. We love AMD. They're really cool guys. I think IBM likes AMD too. Uh, it's just uh, for this particular application, we felt this was the best processor and uh, gave us the best number of options. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so um, basically, it screams. Uh, we got pictures too in a minute, which we're going to try and hurry up and get to. And then uh, step four is upgrade the storage. This is uh, transfer speeds on our, on our previous backups uh, were 2.9 gigabits per second. It's really what we could do on a high-performance backup, and we got that down to, we got that up to 10.5 gigabit per second worth of throughput, and our total, uh, total SSD capacity doubled, and we also moved to 11.5s of one-for-run redundant storage hardware. So there's no longer a single column, both columns, so we just you know, threw a bunch of disk at it. <laughs> uh, 70, 72 uh, SAS drives in RAID 10, and 18 SSDs in RAID 5, I believe. So this is kind of what our CPU graphs look like now. I said they got a lot more load on them, but this is kind of a, uh, Andreas, one of our uh, uh, virtual world admins, took a picture on the third, just to give us a look at what the, what the thing was. This is from the live system. Yeah, live system goes like here. Yeah. That's easier. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the old system, because I'm taller than you, I can do this, <laughs> went up way up there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and actually, some of the gains were we idle somewhere between 11 and 18 percent is where we run during the day, and our backup jobs take us to close to 50, 55 percent CPU for the brand new 24 minutes that it takes us to do a backup now of the entire 1.3 to 1.7 terabyte database, um, which in the past took us 73 minutes to perform. Yeah. Yeah, 73 right. minutes to perform the best backup we could pro possibly perform. And we're down to 23 or 24 minutes, forgot what it is. Yeah, but that, that the tweaks use like 16 gigs of RAM. Okay, and we got <laughs> 512. Yeah, so that's okay, fine. Bite me. Uh, um, <laughs> so just, just, just booting up the machine, if you go into Task Manager, you have uh, 22 gigs allocated uh, of RAM. It's just the overhead of having so much RAM. You need 22 gigabytes of RAM to manage the other RAM. Yeah. <laughs> but it's okay because we've got RAM in RAM now, so it's cool. <laughs> uh, and just to give you a, a visible look at it, this is, this is um, we run a daily uh, uh, analysis tool on the database. And this is the before and after picture of the CPU graph. So this is a normal day run. You can see where our backups are occurring. We're basically idling almost, almost nothing now, uh, where we were idling in the 50% ratio. And uh, this doesn't show the really instantaneous spikes. You know, a graph, they, they kind of squeeze everything down. But um, this was going close to 80, 90% CPU on backups on the old TQ and the new TQ. Basically, we're not hurting the CPUs at all. And this gives us, this isn't that uh, we were completely out of CPU space. It just gives us room to go out and start doing more things on the system. One of the things we're discussing is how much more often we do backups and uh, how much more granularity we can give ourselves in a restoration process. It also stuffed up, well, uh, took our CPU up to 100% for a while. Uh, we stuffed up the servers, 
And when it was loading on the solar system, it went up to 100%. Now it only goes up to like 75, maybe on a startup. Yeah. Which is it's pretty awesome. We could maybe even preload more solar systems so nobody has to wait when they log in. Can I click to the next screen now? Yeah, you can. Thanks. Go ahead. All right. Uh, <laughs> my favorite graph. Okay, so the main thing that we were doing here was we're upgrading the storage system. Do you see a problem with the storage system? <laughs> we were always busy. Now, we're not so busy. And actually, this graph is just the, the best one we could pull up at the time. But uh, like Emil said, we've been, we've been tinkering with the database while you're sleeping. And uh, that's where a lot of these high sections in the center came from, where we were doing some tinkering during the day. Normally, you would only see the two spikes for the startup and the backup. And then the other is just the, um, the usage that we would see on the system. So this is really nice. This means that we're not waiting for IO time on the disk very often. This means we've got lots of headroom to do more things. Um, maybe game design, development, API, they can give access to more things. You know, this just kind of opens up the door for uh, content and game design, do what, they do what they want to, a little bit. No, not what they want to. I, um, not the whole thing? They, they, they can't do what What about the thing do. with like the, the porn and games, no, nothing like that? <laughs> we don't, we're, on, we're on TV now. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And then, oh my god, WTF data. Uh, so we got, we got tons and tons of data. Um, Again, this is up on the, uh, on the dev blog, but basically the, the ones I like to talk about is the whole system is over a terabyte of RAM, 64 logical processors uh, with hyperthreading enabled, of course, 32 gigabit per second of storage throughput capacity, uh, and I actually got that wrong. It should be 64 gigabit per second of aggregate storage throughput <laughs> capacity, 200,000 IOPS. Um, that's my number, not Helgi's, and it's my number. Uh, 51 terabytes of raw data storage capacity, 23 terabytes after RAID and spares. And uh, everything is spared too. You guys that are worried about how we do sparing stuff, everything's global hot spared. Every tray has its own spare and every type of disk has its own spare in each tray. Uh, backups, just so you see the performance numbers. Uh, old TQ was doing 73 uh, minute backups at 2.8 gigabits per second. New TQ on the new drives. 23-minute uh, uh, backups at 8.5 gigabits per second. Now, there are some tweaks that we did to get that. Um, we really only went from 2.8 to in the mid 3 gigabit per second range uh, with just the hardware. But because we had the new hardware, we could change things. We didn't have enough RAM previously to go and change our buffer um, and our max transfer size and our max packet size. Um, we did a lot of that. I, I published that on the dev blog, what the configuration was we used. Don't use it on your home computer. Yeah. It will break your DB. Um, but uh, with that system, we were able to give the, the database server 16 gigs of its own RAM to do the backups, basically, uh, specifically for the I.O. cache. Um, and then uh, also uh, on the rest restoration process, so in a, in a real world scenario, it took us five and a half hours to, or five to five and a half hours to recover TQ from full backup and eight to 12 hours worth of transaction logs. With the new system, we can do that in just under an hour and a half. So um, you know, that's a pretty big improvement on how, how quickly we can recover from real serious, giant, massive issues. And that gets us back in that window where we're talking about disaster recovery, being able to get in under two hours, worst case scenario, we should be able to recover the, the, the DB. And um, yeah, that we're, we're gonna be able to recover the DB in under two hours. Right, Ingvar? Yes, <laughs> word to the mama. Okay, that is the end of that specific presentation and uh, we've got more information if you guys want it I think we just open up for Q&A now yeah but before we open for Q&A uh, we've been asked to pay no attention to you without a mic uh, it's just because they want to have this live on TV and they can't hear you without a mic so if you want if you have a question just raise your hand and the mic will be brought to you so anyone have questions that yeah. guy Thanks. First of all, cool stuff. <laughs> so I had two quick questions, if I may. Um, the first was, again, it's not totally hardware related, but it was about some of the things you said in your opening statement. You were talking about Eve API being 10% of the current load against the database. As a third party developer, I know that one of the things we've been asking for for quite a while is um, to have partial access to some of the lists instead of having to pull back the entire thing just to provide you one line. Uh, that would reduce your load, it would reduce our call time, and everyone's happy. Is that something you guys have thought about or are working on? That's the first question. Okay. Second question is, is when uh, talk of Dust 514, 
and in Karna first came about, the thing CCP absolutely promised would not happen is that those games would not affect gameplay of those that aren't interested. Yet at the beginning, I may have misunderstood. You stated clearly that everything's going to run off the same database, which to me says it's probably going to impact performance whether I'm involved in those systems or not. Okay, so there's a couple of things I can answer this. We'll start with uh, the first one. The first one I can't give you too much detail on, but I can tell you that the core team and a few other teams, um, I think I can even, uh, there's, a, there's a special code name for it, whatever the code name is that I'm not supposed to talk about. They're working on it. They're taking the API and they're pulling it down to an interface and a whole bunch of systems. There's a dev track here to talk about it as well. And it's going to allow them to pull different sets of data up in a different user mode that you can go ahead and pre-sort what's allowed and what's not allowed to be shown uh, to the public. And um, a lot of what they're looking for on these dev tracks is feedback on what you'd like it to be able to do. So saying you don't want to pull the entire transaction history for your character ever at one time. You'd like to pull the last month. Um, and not have to scan the rest, cool, just tell me you want to do that. But yes, there is a conversation about an entire system that's going to be buffered outside of direct access to the TQDB that you can then cache that data into. So if you cache off of it, taking some of the load off the DB, but also caching only in the important parts out there so we don't waste a whole bunch of hardware. Okay, but yes, there's a project in place. Um, the other part with Dust, okay, so um, Dust is a first-person shooter. So the, the, the number one, the largest impact of what happens in Dust is going to be happen in 3D graphics with collision and all kind of stuff on edge servers. Those edge servers are not planned to be part of the TQ cluster at all. So when you're, when you're playing a first-person shooter game, you don't want to be doing that 300 milliseconds away in London. Those servers are going to be globally distribu distributed and located near the players. That's the only way you can do a first-person shooter game if you want high fidelity, so to speak. On, uh, the, on the database side, though, where characters are logging in, managing their accounts, uh, getting access to contracts, whatever other tools and cool things they're going to do, have that, having that happen inside the TQ cluster is extremely nominal. There's also not a big burden on the solar system uh, nodes, and it's mainly just more database action. So what we really want to do is we want to say, hey, give this guy some more database room so that we had the ability to support the database growth in size that it was going to need as well as um, the number of transactions it was going to need without impacting the players. So this, this is actually specifically to allow us to handle that. Yeah, and, and these, these test services run on their own nodes, so, yeah. so it wouldn't impact the, like, the, the solar system, right? It's, it's similar to like the market nodes. Yeah. Uh, it, it'd be another module inside the cluster, and that, m that market node cluster doesn't really go out and beat up the DB. It has its own n set of nodes. Same thing with the dust nodes. Uh, same thing with uh, planetary interaction. All, all these services that come out, they have their own dedicated nodes. Good afternoon. I got a kind of two-part question from two ends of the spectrum. Um, I know there's been a kind of standard request for a while for any fleet fights that are going to involve more than 100 ships. I don't know if that means on each team. Um, to let you guys know ahead of time, will this uh, hardware expansion obviate that, or are you still going to need that? Uh, uh, well, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. I mean, it's uh, the hardware, the DB hardware is not going to have a lot no. to do with fleet fights. Uh, the, the main load in fleet fight goes on the solar system nodes, so upgrading the database hardware does not really have a lot with, with fleet fights, though, though faster DB calls might have a bit. So okay. But uh, we, we, we want to know beforehand of every, uh, every fleet battle so we can put on uh, its own dedicated node before it happens. If, if that does not happen, if, if what a fleet battle happens on a node that has not, uh, in a solar system that has not been dedicated, then uh, both players and other systems will affect the fleet battle, and the fleet battle will negatively affect the gameplay. Of, yeah, well, <laughs> negatively affect the, <laughs> the gameplay of people in other systems. So, so we, will, we'll, we will definitely want to know about fleet battles beforehand. And we have a, a, a few month old system where, where the dedication of fleet fights is automatic. So, so if you if you request a fleet fleet, fight, uh, fleet battle node, you will get it automatically at next downtime. We have some more detail on that on the keynote presentation at three. We're okay. talking about fleet fights, and we'll be talking about the fleet fight notification tool and other predictive tools that we have. Yeah. Yeah. The second part is the other end of the spectrum, sort of. I do a lot of just solo ratting and stuff, and salvaging. And so, will this upgrade? Is it? I'm going to have less time now from when I loot somebody else's wreck before I turn red to everybody else in the system and have to get away. 
No. no. Oh. That's, a, that's, an in, that's an in game mechanic. It won't have anything to do with the, the latency that the server has. Okay. Yeah, cool. yeah it, that's in memory thing on this whole node. So it n the, the flagging never goes to the database. Oh, okay. I don't know how back end stuff works at all. I just the you know, I, I'm point and click guy. <laughs> So, so the uh, the only thing, that, the only caveat I'd add to it won't help performance the the DB as far as in game as far as Fleet Fight goes. There's things that we don't know. Uh, so one of the things is the number of DB sessions that are being opened to the database from the soul nodes. We can actually map how many sessions are allowed for a physical server. Um, right now, uh, hey Elander, how many nodes we got? How many DB sessions do we allow per node right now? Is it are we on to 128 or 256 again? I think we changed to 156. Okay, yeah, so we have some fixes we're doing. But basically, it's a number of deep sim uh, DB threads that can be opened from a single sol solar system or solar system node to the database. Um, there's some limitations. Uh, it's called small integer with Microsoft, 6,500 and no, 65,000. It's 32,000. 32,000, yeah. So we can only open so many sessions, so we have to limit what happens. We have a few uh, new upgrades that come along with our software upgrade. It's yeah. going to allow us to auto grow um, or auto remove those sessions. Plus, because the system is operating faster, it might have to call fewer sessions because it has less weight going on, and we might be able to give Fleet Fights more sessions. So what happens when we take the number of DB sessions from 256 to 1024? Uh, we haven't tested that part of it yet, and it's something that if I can get Ellender talked into it, we'll test. Yeah, we, we've had the problem of, of uh, not being able to disconnect DB sessions when they've been established. Uh, you might remember my blog from Mars last year where I talked about why we're always crashing? Quit plugging your blogs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I blogged about this and, and it was pretty vague, but we had a crash bug in SQL Server. Uh, we had a Microsoft case ongoing from November 2009 up until last month when they uh, released a hotfix. When we changed to DB hardware, we also applied the hotfix. So now we can start uh, releasing idle DB sessions. So and then we can increase the limit of DB sessions on each node without risking uh, going up to the limit of the SQL Server itself. So, uh, but we, we didn't test that. We haven't tested that yet. It's so coming soon, though. Yeah. TM. Yeah, TM. Well, we didn't want to change too much when we deployed the new hardware. So yeah, we, we decided that replacing every single piece of hardware on the DB was enough for one day, and then. Uh, we were going to come back later and update some more software and then yeah. patch windows or something silly. Well, uh, yeah, we do, we'll, we'll, we'll do more, more configuration uh, after FanFest. We were pretty busy before the FanFest as well. More questions? Go for it. Yeah, excuse me. I'm not very good at asking questions on microphones. <coughs> um, Sorry. We're, we were involved in a little scuffle a few weeks ago in a system that nobody's heard of, 6VDT. Mm -hmm. um, and there were quite a few guys in the system at the time. And what we were finding was that it would be fine for five minutes that it would just lock. Um, I'm sure it's something you're going to cover this afternoon in the Fleet Fights thing, but I might not be there, which is why I'm asking now. Okay. So, no, we'll tell you special. Don't worry about it. Go ahead. Yeah, but when we talk about reinforcing nodes, what's the actual mechanic of that? Because what I can't get my head around is what numbers are in a system before it has a, an epifit without being reinforced. <laughs> And what's the higher number once you've actually got it reinforced? Oh, it, it, this is a question that's hard to answer because uh, you, you don't know beforehand how many people are going to be on a node that not, has not been, been reinforced. Uh, nodes are mapped based on uh, previous load. So we use the load numbers from the previous two weeks or something like that to, to dynamically map system. Uh, can I throw something back in on that? Because because when you're logging in and you're involved in these big fleet fights and you're realizing that maybe 10% of the population of EVE mm -hmm. is in one system or surrounding systems, yeah. how can that be improved so that there's yeah. some kind of reac reaction going on so at we CCP? We, we have, we have a, a lot of things going on. We've got some things that are happening in software. We've also got people staring at graphs. So we actually have our GMs. They, they're looking at this, um, this little spreadsheet. I mean, sorry, this little graphical interface, and it says, hey, there's 250 people in a system right now. Oh, shit. Yeah, please call ops. And so even if you haven't notified us, we actually have the GMs go, and they're like, oh, crap, it looks like it's going to be noisy in here. Can you guys reinforce this? But unfortunately, right now at least, we don't have the ability to move you to a dedicated node 
during, this, during the run without disconnecting people. So right now, the smartest thing to do is if, you, if you're in a node that you knew you were going to have a fleet fight in and it's laggy, it's because your FC, your director, your CEO has failed. They need to actually <laughs> open up. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Uh, they need to open up uh, their, their little, um, uh, beginning to go to the, the Fleet Fight tool, I think it's like fleetfight.apx or whatever, you know, um, on, the, on EVE Online, and just to tell us when they're going to have the Fleet Fight. Tell us what size it's going to be, tell us what system or systems it's going to be in, and every single one of those get dedicated every single time. Can I add to that? Because you've, sure. you've raised a really good point about the fact that if you haven't reinforced it, you're going to get disconnected. Why don't you just put a message up? Because we're going to get disconnected anyway. Yeah. We, 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 do we, do. Re, we do remap uh, systems. Uh, if, you have, if you have a fleet fight and the node is dying, we do remap systems to dedicated nodes, uh, but we don't want to involve ourselves in a fleet fight before it, it has gone down the drain. You know. Yeah, so I mean, if like one alliance has jumped in, it's getting kind of laggy, and we've disconnected them, and they get to load the system before the other, you know, so we actually want you to blow up the servers. If you didn't make the request from us when you should have, um, then we want you to blow up your own server, cause your own problem, and then we'll come in and fix it for you. But that's when everybody's had the same problem, right? It, it's just a fair way to handle it. And also, there's, there's another thing that, that might look a little odd to you. Sometimes you're, you do get remapped to a dedicated node, and the stuff still crashes and still dies, and it continues. We, there, I, there are limits to what the hardware can do. So you put 3,000 players in a system, we're not remapping you anywhere else. I mean, yeah. I don't have another server <laughs> that'll do that. So you're just going to stay there and you're going to continually crash the node. And our goal at that point is just to move you off of nodes that have other people on it so you don't bother them while you're playing your game. So it's just, you know, th there, there's a few limits. So if you just want to hear some, some general numbers, and we'll talk about this more at the, uh, the keynote, but um, uh, seven, 800 people without any lag, 1,000 to 1,200 people manageable in a system that's been dedicated. Um, anything over that, it's a crapshoot with how far we're going to get you. You put Drake's or, or Ham Assault, uh, you know, Ham uh, Cerberus's or something like that in there, it's going to be different. You know, it, each ship's going to have a different impact on what happens in the game. Thanks, guys. Yeah, no worries. Okay. More questions? Yeah. That dude. Nice scarf. A few months ago, before I became a little inactive in EVE, I was part of a coalition with about 15 alliances. And uh, once in a while, we would go into zero zero and we would um, do these, these attacks on, on a certain station that we were attacking them at the point. And RFC made it very clear that each time we would do this, at least 24 hours before, he would go in and file one of these fleet report forms. And uh, not once were we reinforced, and we were only about 300 pilots before everyone started desyncing and all that. And I was wondering what your uh, opinion is about that. Wait, uh, when was it? Sorry? Wh how long ago was it? This was several months ago. I don't actually remember. Yeah, new tool's been in place in the uh, last month, month and a half maybe? Yeah, two, two months. Yeah. Uh, Not last month, two months. If you have a request and it comes in now and it doesn't get handled, um, one of the guys in virtual world operations is beaten with a stick. Uh, <laughs> but, but like, if the fleet... Sigurd knows the what I'm <laughs> talking about. <laughs> Okay, if, if the fleet commander did not file a request before downtime, then we can't reinforce the node. So if you file a, a report about the fleet fight after downtime, the, the system has already been mapped, most likely with other systems. So the fleet commander might just have filed the report too late. Yep. And, and if you guys got feedback on this too, like you want to be able to give us a larger window of fights, more systems requested in a single request. Just make those requests uh, and we actually do listen to them. And the current system, it's just basically managed out of the web page. And we can go in and modify the rules on what, what you can you request, how, how far in the future or how far in the past you can request it. More questions? Okay. Guy back there with the Michael Jackson glove. You mentioned that <coughs> the uh, V7000 series has the ability to house uh, SAS disks and the uh, the RAMSAN. Um, no. Can you talk about that a little bit? Or, well, or am I it, it, it doesn't host uh, a RAMSAN. It, it hosts IBM SSDs, which were provided by Helki, who sits next to you. <laughs> uh, so we, we, we've actually retired 
all of our RAM sends they, they uh, will be used in, in on other servers within our network, test test servers or, or web database. So, so what you're saying is the RAM send is a separate system. The, the RAM send is like a, a single big single unit. And and now that unit isn't connected to the database anymore. But that but that unit held SSDs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, the, the Ramsan has the Ramsan had nine SSDs and a RAID three, I believe is what it was. So the Ramsans were basically just a black box with SSDs inside that were a separate module. And what we gained from the V7000 was the controller and all the tiers of storage were inside of one tower of systems. So we could mix and match performance and have our controller and caching handling all the tiers instead of what we had with the, um, the RAM SANS, which are, again, great boxes, really fast, we love them. But we had to have a, a module that was for SSD fast. We had to have a module that was for RAM fast. We had to have a module that was for uh, fiber channel drives slow. Yeah. You know, so we, we had these three tiers of storage, all of them physical environments, and we were to put all those into one now. Yeah, and now, now uh, ex expanding our system is, is really easy because each SSD it's just a, a laptop size hard drive which you put in a slot. So getting getting more disks is really easy and expanding our storage. We can expand our storage by less than, well, what the Ramson 500 is like one to two terabytes and costs a lot of money. But we can expand by, by smaller increments yeah. now. 300 gig, yeah, 300 gig increments. And, and to give you an example of how much room we have, right uh, today, we have uh, 45 drives in one side of the column. So nine SSDs, 36 uh, SAS drives, do the math right. Um, we can take that to f 240 drives in one column. Yeah, Helgi's gonna correct me. Go ahead, Helgi. 960. 960, because of firmware, well. da, 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 da. But anyway, so there's been some updates. What they publish on their website is 240, it's really 960. So that means we could put, I don't know, about 915 more SSDs in place if we wanted to <laughs> and really boost the performance. <laughs> So what we basically done is we, I went back, we went back to the executive board, we said, hey, we're gonna be able to future-proof your database storage for Eve, Dust, and Karna. Just tell us what you want and buy the disk. And, and the lead time is, is way shorter than getting like the smaller IBM disks than, than getting a RAM sand. Yeah, it took, took us a month at a time to buy a RAM sand where we could get an SSD from Helgi that he keeps on stock for us here whenever we want it in like two or three days. What's up? Interesting. I have one one other question. Uh, what uh, what sort of fiber channel switch uh, are you guys using? Um, brocade fiber channel switches is what we're using. The eight gig, twenty four port brocades. Thanks. Two, two of those. More questions. <laughs>